What's up everybody, it's Dan from SageMathTutoring.com. Uh, this is another video covering some topics that I went over with my friend and tutoring student uh, about parabolas and quadratic equations. So uh, I'm going to cover two problems here, which as usual with a lot of math problems, <laughs> uh, two quote unquote problems are uh, each problem is composed of sub problems. So it's really more than two problems. You can think of it that way. Uh, but anyway, let's get started with this. So basically what the teacher is doing is presenting, you know, a quadratic function and running us through various exercises to see if we could figure out based off of this information, whether or not the graph opens up or down, what the coordinates of the vertex are, et cetera, et cetera. I think the first thing to note is that this function is written in general form. So in other words, it takes this form, which is important to note because uh, the way that you analyze the general form of a quadratic function is different than the way that you would analyze the vertex form of a quadratic function. So anyway, you know, the A in this case, of course, would be uh, two, the B in this case would be four, and the C in this case would be three. So that's important to note. Looking at the first question, does the graph open up or down? My uh, student and friend is very good at knowing the answer to this question. Basically, all I have to do is look at A. If A is positive, then you know that the graph opens up. If A is negative, then you know that the graph opens down. So that's the first thing to know. Uh, clearly, the A in this case, since it's 2, is positive. So the graph definitely opens up. Moving on determine uh, the coordinate of the vertex. Okay, so we're gonna actually shrink this down because determining the coordinates of the vertex is a two-step problem in reality. And what I'm gonna do is just shrink this down. And I'm gonna rewrite the function up here so we could like really look at it. So it's g of x equals 2x squared plus 4x plus 3. And I'm pretty sure I'm right about that, but I want to make sure that that's correct. Yes, it is correct. Okay, so as many of you know, and certainly as my student knows, a good way to find the coordinates of the vertex is to first find the x-coordinate of the vertex. And the way to find the x-coordinate of the vertex when the quadratic function is written in this general form is to use this formula, which is really sort of a preview. It's really the way to find the equation of the axis of symmetry. But for now, we'll just think of this as the way to find the x-coordinate of the vertex. And sidetrack, the vertex of any parabola is this little point right here. It's in a sense the point where the parabola changes direction. As you know, or as you could tell, it's kind of going down from left to right there. And then somewhere in this moment, it changes direction and now it's going up. So that point where the parabola changes direction that's the vertex, all right? So let's just keep that stuff in mind. Um, let's move on. So looking at this uh, equation that would allow us to find the x-coordinate, clearly we we'll wanna make sure that we're clear on what b is and what a is, and then we could just plug it in, substitute it in, and then we're good to go. I have a big trick of the trade that I employ all the time where I immediately rewrite a formula like this, including the quadratic formula, in such a way that instead of b and a, I have empty parentheses. Uh, that is a really, really good idea because it prevents you from making careless mistakes regarding the signs of various numbers, as uh, you'll see later. For now, all we have to do is just plug in what belongs here. 
Well, we know. What's A? It's 2. What's B? It's 4. So we just put those numbers in where they belong. And then we do the necessary calculations. Negative 4 over positive 4. Obviously, that is going to give us um, you know, negative 1 at the end of the day. So that is at least the x coordinate of the vertex right there. So that's something to take note of. And once we have the x coordinate of the vertex, then it's actually fairly easy to find the y coordinate of the vertex. The way that you find the y coordinate of the vertex is you take this x coordinate and you plug it in to the function and then you find out what number it churns out. So let's do that right now. Uh, and in reality, what that really means is that we're finding g of negative 1. So we're going to do that. We're going to replace all the x's with a negative 1, and we're going to find out what we get as a result of that. This is where PEMDAS really comes into play. Uh, I want my student listening to this to really remember that when you substitute a number in for x, please uh, apply the exponent first before you do anything. I'm going to represent that next step below because when we apply the exponent here, negative 1 squared becomes a positive 1. So I'm actually going to represent that right here. And looking at this, negative 1 times positive 4 is definitely a negative 4, so that's going to be a negative 4 plus 3. And then on the next line, it would be 2 times 1 is 2, minus 4, plus 3. And then we have negative 2 plus 3, and that is, of course, 1. So this is the y-coordinate, and this is the x-coordinate. Quick recap. When the problem asked us to determine the coordinate, this really should say coordinates of the vertex, they want the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate of the vertex of this function right here. The first step is to find the x-coordinate. The way that we find the x-coordinate is to bust out this equation right here, negative b over 2a, and you know b would be 4, a would be 2. That enables us to find the x-coordinate. Once we've already found the x-coordinate, we swing back in here, and we plug in negative 1 into x. We substitute negative 1 in for x. We did that down here, and that gives us the y-coordinate. And to sort of top it off at the end of the day, you could write down the coordinate of the vertex as negative 1, comma 1. That is the answer to this question right here. Determine the coordinates of the vertex. It would be negative 1, comma 1 after all that work. Okay, so let's... Get rid of some of this stuff here. The next question has to do with determining the coordinate of the y-intercept, which we're going to do next. So when you want to determine the coordinate of the y-intercept, that's actually very, very easy. All right, that's the good news. Here is, once again, the equation, or the function. And all you have to do to find the coordinate of the y-intercept is to substitute 0 in for x. You replace x with 0. That's all there is to it. So in reality, we're really finding g of 0. And g of 0 is nothing more than substituting 0 in for x. Now, this happens to be a fairly easy calculation that you could do pretty quickly even in your head. I mean, this whole thing is just going to become a 0. This whole thing is just going to become a 0. And it's going to leave a positive 3 at the end of the day. Now, we want to be careful because 3 is the y-intercept right we could say that we could say that three is the y-intercept but just to kind of kiss the teacher's butt a little bit we want to be super specific with the wording it says determine the coordinate coordinates 
of the y-intercept. I'm gonna assume that this should be coordinates. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the teacher means coordinate singular, but on the safe side, I'm gonna assume that this means the coordinate of the y-intercept. And what that means to me is to give the x and y coordinates. Now, maybe that's a mistake on my part. Um, you could always be like, the y-intercept is three, and then the um, coordinates of the y-intercept would be zero comma three. And that should make sense because on the xy coordinate plane, you know, let's say the parabola looks something like this. And actually I'll make it a little higher. Let's say the parabola looks something like that. Well, the coordinates of the y-intercept would be right there. And that most definitely has an x-coordinate of zero. And in this case, a y-coordinate of three. And I'd like to highlight the fact that when you're dealing with a y-intercept, the coordinates of that y-intercept will always have an x-coordinate of zero. Anytime you cross the y-axis, the x-coordinate of that point of intersection will always be zero. So you can very confidently have zero as the x-coordinate. But a quick recap nonetheless, just to kind of look at the big picture. When they ask you, what are the coordinates of the y-intercept? Um, all you have to do is plug in zero for x and then find out what the y value is at the end of the day, all right? And if you want to kiss the teacher's butt, actually list it as zero comma three as the literal point of intersection. So that is that next one. And the next problem has to do with finding the solutions of the function. Find the solutions of the function. Now that's code for uh, find out what x equals when y is 0. In other words, set this equal to 0 and then solve for x. Now, my stu uh, student has already done this before in terms of learning how to solve quadratic equations, you know, set it equal to zero. Sometimes you might want to factor this. Sometimes you might want to complete the square. Sometimes you might want to use the quadratic formula. Uh, I would advise just use the quadratic formula. Uh, my student in particular has it memorized fairly well. And the quadratic formula might not always be the fastest way to solve a quadratic equation, but it is most definitely a reliable way. It is a way that will work every single time. So I would advise using it. As a reminder, the quadratic formula is this. It's this whole thing. b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now, when using the quadratic formula, I will once again heavily suggest uh, drawing empty parentheses. I'm going to do this in a different color just to avoid confusion. Empty parentheses. So we have negative b as a negative empty parentheses. We have empty parentheses squared minus 4, guess what, empty parentheses, all over 2 times empty parentheses. And then you just fill in what belongs in each parentheses from there. And I'm going to do that right now. So b is 4, so I'm going to put that there and there. A is 2, put that there and there, and C is 3. And you would go through the motions of this calculation, which I'm going to do right now. Let's find out what all this is. So we got negative 4 plus minus, that would be 16 minus uh, 12. No, minus, pardon me, 24. And then what else do we have? All over 2 times 2. And let's just get this over with right now. That's definitely 4. Now, here's what I'm going to do right now. Could I go through the motions and figure out, you know, um, what the solutions are or sort of whittle this down and simplify it? Absolutely. But here's something that I'd like my student and you all watching to just be on the lookout for because it might save you some work. And that is the fact that 
we can already see that this is going to be a negative number, right? Uh, 16 minus 24, what is that, negative 8? So that would be a negative number underneath this radical symbol. So right out the gate, immediately, we can see that this is going to be an imaginary number, right? Anytime you have a negative number underneath a radical, that's an imaginary number. So you know what that means? That means there are no real solutions. In other words, this parabola, you know, and again, we don't really know what it looks like necessarily just yet, but uh, we know it points upward, and we know that it hovers above the x-axis. Okay, maybe it's over here, maybe it's over here. I'm not really sure just yet. Um, but we know that it hovers above, so in other words, it doesn't cross the x-axis. All right, and in algebra speak, we could say that it has no real solutions. Okay, so the answer to this question right here, find the solutions of the function, is no real solutions. That's what you could write. I do believe your teacher would be happy with that. So that's how you do that one. Uh, quick recap. What did we do? We just broke out the quadratic formula. Had we gotten real solutions, we would have had two real solutions. It would have been negative 4 plus blah, 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 and it would have been negative 4 minus whatever this is. All right, all over 4. Okay, but we don't have real solutions, so we actually could sort of save ourselves the additional work of going through all that. Moving on to the next section, let's see. Determine the coordinates of the uh, x-intercepts. Well, you know what? Check this out, dude. When there's no solutions, you know what that means? That means that uh, this parabola does not even <laughs> does not even cross the x-axis. It doesn't even cross it. So you know what the coordinates of the x-intercepts are? Nothing. There aren't any x-intercepts. Thank God we can move on and not even worry about it. Moving on. Determine the equation of the axis of symmetry. Well, this is uh, swinging back to a strategy that we employed earlier. So I'd like my student to notice the relationship between this question, determine the axis, the equation of the axis of symmetry, and this question, determine the coordinates of the vertex, where it looks like the teacher in my buddy's class, or maybe my buddy's friend, reminded my buddy slash student that the way to find the coordinate of the vertex is to bust out negative b over 2a. Well, guess what? We did that before even in this video and we're gonna do it again. We're gonna use negative b over 2a to find the equation of the axis of symmetry. Now, let's get very clear, first of all, what is the axis of symmetry? The axis of symmetry is when you have a parabola and it is this invisible vertical line that passes through the vertex of the parabola. It is this invisible vertical line that um, sort of cuts the parabola in half, in half from a visual perspective. And since it is an invisible vertical line, it's important to realize the equation of any vertical line always takes the form of x equals some number, let's call it a. Um, so when you're writing down the equation of a vertical line, it's always gonna look like that. So it's gonna be x equals some number. Maybe it's x equals three in which case it would be a vertical line that passes through the x value of three on the x-axis. Maybe it would be the equation, an equation for a vertical line could be x equals negative four. Well, in that case, it would be a vertical line passing through this x value of negative four. The moral of the story is the equation of vertical lines always looks like x equals some number, x equals three, x equals negative four. It's always gonna be x equals some number. And when they ask you for the equation of the axis of symmetry, keep in mind, they're asking for the equation of a vertical line. So your final answer should include x equals whatever that number is. Now, the question is, what is that number? Well, it's the number 
that you would get by doing the negative over a negative b over 2a thing, which we'll just uh, do again. We'll do right now. So let's take a look here. Uh, we already did this, but I erased it, so whatever. It's going to be x equals negative b over 2a, and therefore it's x equals negative empty parentheses over 2 times empty parentheses. Now we're going to plug it in. Well, what is b? b is 4. What is a? a is 2. And this would definitely turn into negative 1. So uh, make no mistake about it. The final answer should be x equals negative 1. Okay, uh, that is very important to understand that you want to include um, this whole thing, x equals negative 1. That's actually the answer. You don't have to include this underline, but you need to include the whole thing when you're giving the equation of the axis of symmetry. So that's important. Let's see, the domain, the domain, well, check this out. The domain of any um, quadratic function, uh, unless it's like a weird situation where there's clear restrictions, is always, always, always going to be negative infinity, comma, positive infinity. So that's interval notation. That's probably the notation that the teacher would prefer. And um, just to be very clear, why is the domain that? I don't want to just have you like memorize the fact that it will always be negative infinity, positive infinity. Let's get clear on why. So uh, when you have a parabola, you know, maybe it goes up forever. In this case, it does. You know, it, does, it goes up forever. Uh, so we know the range is going to have something to do with positive infinity for sure. But as far as the domain goes, keep in mind, the domain has to do with you know, the set of all x values on the x-axis that are represented in the parabola, it's important to remember that parabolas, yeah, 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 they go up forever, sure. But you know what else they do? They go out forever, in that direction and in that direction. Uh, and for that reason, all these x values are going to get represented somewhere on the graph. And all these x values are going to get represented somewhere on the graph over here. So that's why we say the domain is negative infinity and positive infinity. This represents the lower end of the spectrum of the domain, and this represents the higher end of the spectrum of the domain. So that's why the domain is that. Okay, the range. Hmm. Okay, well, you know, you could figure out the range by sort of getting clear on what the vertex here is, getting clear on the fact that it opens up. But I think probably the least confusing way to find the range is to start graphing this damn thing and then kind of look at it and then figure out what the range is based off of what it looks like. That might be a little bit of a departure from what the teacher recommends. Once again, the teacher might want you to look at the vertex and look at the fact that the graph opens up and draw conclusions about that. But I think the least confusing way is to just graph this thing. Now, I will say we're kind of ruining the next problem because the next problem asks us to graph it. But I'm going to say, let's graph it right now because we already have a lot of information about this graph. Uh, let's review the information. First of all, we know it opens up, so let's keep that in mind. Um, we know what the vertex is. It is negative 1, 4. I do believe that's correct from what we graphed before. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to graph the vertex, right? It's uh, negative 1, comma. Uh, it just dawned on me that this is wrong. We already figured out the vertex. We're going to get rid of that. And the real vertex is negative 1, comma 1. We already figured that out from before. So uh, this is notes from my students' work from before. I'm just kind of bringing it in here. But we already discovered, you know, from before what the coordinates of the vertex are. It's negative 1, comma 1. So we're actually going to write that in here. We're going to put that in the graph. Uh, negative 1, 1. All right. What else do we know about this graph? We know that the coordinates of the y-intercept, uh, we had discovered before that the literal coordinate is 0, comma 3. But the y-intercept itself is 3. That is definitely correct. So we're going to put that in here. We're just going to put that there. 
Now, what else do we know? The solutions of the function is, well, there's no solutions, which makes sense because it goes up. The coordinates of the x-intercepts, well, there's no x-intercepts because uh, it goes up, <laughs> right? So it doesn't cross the x-axis at all. Determine the equation of the axis of symmetry. That would be x equals negative 1. You know, maybe the teacher would appreciate it if you kind of drew that axis of symmetry. That would be this invisible dotted line that kind of cuts through the vertex. And, you know, to be honest, that could serve as a reminder that if this is the axis of symmetry, well, guess what? That means that uh, everything on this side is going to match everything on that side, at least visually. So that should sort of give us license immediately to draw a point right there. All right. Why? Because it's supposed to be perfectly matching this point over here. Right. And honestly, most teachers would probably prefer more points than just three. Um, but, you know, I have a feeling that for this particular exercise, uh, the teachers are going to worry too much about uh, perfect accuracy. So let's just kind of draw a parabola that goes through those points. It's going to look something like that. It's kind of ugly looking, <laughs> but you get the idea. So the vertex is right there. So the reason why we're graphing it like right away is because we wanted to determine the range. And the range is the set of all y values that are represented on this parabola. And I think it's a decent idea to draw a graph of the parabola so as to get an idea of what the range is. Now, uh, my graphing, my drawing skills were kind of crappy. But this is the vertex, which means that the lowest point, even though it looks like it dips below, the lowest point of this parabola is actually right here. So all of the y uh, values that are represented start here, and then it goes up from there forever. It's all these y values, all right? So that would be the range, and clearly we're going from 1 all the way up into positive infinity there. And the way to write that in interval notation is, well, it's definitely from 1 to positive infinity. Infinity is always going to get that parentheses, and the 1 in this case is going to get a bracket. So for this assignment, it's safe to say that if you get a number in the interval notation, it's always going to have a bracket next to it. Um, and the reason for that is because the y value of 1, which is right here on the y-axis, it's actually included in the graph. And whenever something's included, you want to put brackets around it. Infinity, whether it's positive infinity or negative infinity, always gets a parentheses around it. When it comes to uh, numbers, if the number itself is included in the set, you give it a bracket. My student understands that decently well. Hopefully, uh, you guys at home understand that too. Next one is graph the parabola on the coordinate plane given above. Well, guess what? We already did that. Bam. All right, moving on. So I'm going to do this a little bit more quickly. Just follow my thinking, follow my steps if you can. We've got negative x squared minus 2x plus 2. Does the graph open up or down? Well, my student already knew that it opens down because my student looked at a. It was uh, negative 1. It's the coefficient of the leading term. So it does open down. That means that the horns point down. Determine the coordinate of the vertex. Well, my student knew to at least think about this formula, right? We're at least thinking about this formula. So we're going to use it. Once again, um, when it comes to this question, determine the coordinate of the vertex, we're going to find the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. And that is a two-step problem. It is a matter of finding the x-coordinate first by using this thing. And then we're going to find the y-coordinate after that. So before I even do any of this, let me write the function. It's f of x equals negative x squared minus 2x plus 2. So first things first, let's find the x-coordinate of the vertex, knowing full well that that will be to use this formula. I'm just going to sort of save space by doing it over here. Now, once again, do you see me using these empty parentheses? In place of B, I put empty parentheses. Instead of A, I put empty parentheses. Why do I do that? Well, because we want to be very, very careful. Because what is A? It is a negative 1. What is B? It is a negative 2. 
So what goes in this empty parentheses? A negative two. What goes in this empty parentheses? A negative one. And as you can clearly see, it's going to be a negative negative two, which will pump out a positive two over what will be a negative two over here. And that ends up becoming negative one, all right? So we could say the x coordinate of the vertex is negative one. Now to find the y coordinate of the vertex, we take this negative one and we plug it into the function. This is also known as um, finding f of negative one. So that would be negative. Look at me doing empty parentheses again. It's always a good idea. Keep it clean, keep it organized. Plugging in our negative one here, negative one. Let's get really clear about this. Using PEMDAS, we know we want to apply this exponent here first. So this actually becomes a positive one. So uh, we're going to actually represent that in term step. It's a negative what? Negative positive one. And then this is kind of a weird debacle. That's a negative two times a negative one. What does that become? A positive two. And then we have this positive two right here left over. So that's just gonna be a, a positive two. So we have negative one plus two plus two. At the end of the day, that will be three, right? So that's the Y coordinate of the vertex. Bam, three, done. You know, I'm actually gonna write that right here. What was it? Uh, negative one comma three. I'm gonna keep track of our progress right now. So that is that thing. All right, looking at the next thing that they want us to do. Oh. Next thing that they want us to do is to determine the coordinate of the Y intercept. Okay, so as I said in the last section, determining the coordinate of the Y intercept is fairly easy. Um, I'm going to write the function down once again. That is f of x equals negative x, negative x squared minus 2x plus 2. All right, so when you want to find the uh, coordinate of the y intercept, all you have to do is set all these x's equal to 0, also known as finding f of 0. So that's negative. Uh, empty parentheses squared minus 2 times empty parentheses plus 2. This is a negative symbol. Let's not forget that. And what goes in those empty parentheses? Well, a 0, right? And, you know, as before, fairly easy calculation to make. This whole thing is just going to be a 0, regardless of the negative, regardless of the exponent of 2. Whole thing's just going to become a 0. This whole thing's going to become a 0. You know what it's going to leave? 2. That's what it's going to leave. So guess what? The coordinates of the uh, y-intercept would be 0, comma, 2, with the y-intercept itself being 2, okay? But the coordinates of the y-intercept are 0, 2, all right? So that's important to keep in mind. Um, we're going to write that on the piece of paper right here. So... We'll do it in green, 0, comma, 2. Bam. All right, moving on. What do we got? Find the solutions of the function. Well, what do we do when we find the solutions of the function? We break out the quadratic formula, which will be negative b plus minus b squared minus 4ac just cut into the chase by drawing these empty parentheses, all over 2a, and just filling in what belongs there. That's a negative 2, that's a negative 2, a is negative 1, c is 2, um, and a is negative 1 right there. All right, so we're going to do this calculation over here. Underneath, we're looking at x equals positive 2, because negative negative 2 is positive 2, plus minus uh, negative 2 squared is 4. And before I even get into this, let's just do this calculation. Negative 4 times negative 1 times 
Negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4 times 2 is positive 8. So that's going to be a plus positive 8. You go plus 8 all over negative 2. All right, so that's that one. And uh, let's keep going. So that would be x equals 2 plus minus radical 12 all over negative 2. And um, let's see, this uh, radical 12, I mean, that's really equal to 2 radical 3. And that's all over negative 2. This could actually be simplified further as, um, what is it? Uh, negative 1 plus minus uh, radical 3. But we're going to leave it alone here because my student is allowed to use calculators. So I think it might even be worthwhile to just sort of plug this into the calculator. What I would do is I would plug in 2 plus this thing all over negative 2 into the calculator. And then you're going to get something. And then I would try 2 minus whatever this is all over negative 2. And then you're going to get something else. So you should get two solutions here. I'm actually going to pause this video and work it out in my calculator right now. Yeah, so sure enough, um, this pumped out some very interesting numbers. When I put 2 plus 2 radical 3 all over negative 2 into the calculator, by the way, I'm using Desmos app, which is freaking amazing. Uh, definitely recommend that. I should get paid by them to say that. Uh, the first solution ends up becoming, I'll just write this a little bit nicer. It's going to be x equals negative 2.732, and we'll just kind of round it there. And the other solution, um, I'll just write and, the other solution ended up being a positive 0.732 approximately. All right. So these are the two quote unquote solutions. And how did we get there? We got there by using the quadratic formula. All right, so when they asked to find the solution of the function, bust out the quadratic formula, since my student's allowed to use his calculator, I'm gonna say go ahead and, you know, maybe make some headway with the uh, quadratic formula. And once you get to an easily manageable input, put that into the calculator. Now. Could you, if you were using a sufficient, you know, graphing calculator, put all this in there right out the gate? Uh, definitely, but you'd have to be super careful with like your parentheses, right? When you're plugging it into the calculator. Um, you know, you might have to wrap this whole thing in parentheses and then the whole top thing in parentheses. They can be like parentheses within parentheses. So you'd have to be super careful with that. That's why you might be better off just doing these calculations, whittling it down a little bit and then put that into the calculator. But anyway, turns out these numbers. So uh, I'm going to write those numbers here. So we got um, negative uh, 2.732. And we could even kiss the teacher's butt and say x equals this number, negative 2.732. And it also equals uh, 0.732. So it also equals 0.732. Good times. Okay. So then they're like, determine the coordinates of the x-intercepts. All right, we'll check this out. You ready for this move? <laughs> I mean, first of all, anytime you got a parabola crossing the x-axis, right? Here's the x-intercepts. Bam. Well, guess what? The coordinates of the x-intercept will certainly be an x-coordinate and certainly be a y-coordinate. You know, with the x-coordinate here and the y-coordinate here, x-coordinate here, y-coordinate here. Well, you know, you go through the motions to find the x-coordinate, you know, maybe if you want to find the x-intercepts. But the one thing we do know right out the gate is the y-coordinate. A y coordinate is definitely freaking zero. You know, anytime you cross the x axis, in that moment, the y coordinate is going to be zero. I promise you. Every single time. All right, so just keep that in mind. Uh, that's certainly applicable when they're asking us 
for the um, x-intercepts, right? The coordinates of the x-intercepts, right? So let's see right here. So um, that begs the question, you know, what is the x-coordinate of the x-intercepts? It's like, great, the y-coordinate of the x-intercepts is zero. But what is the x-coordinate of the x-intercepts? Well, here's the good news. We found them already. The x-coordinate of the x-intercepts are the solutions of the function. All right? That's sort of what's meant by solutions, actually. So here they are. Once again, we know the y-coordinates would be 0. And the x-coordinates would be these numbers. So I'm actually going to blow this up so I can fit it in there. So we got negative 2.732. Well, and we also have 0 0.732. So kind of clunky video. Sorry, guys, but I'm actually still getting the hang of this. I'm pretty new to this stuff. So this is me getting the hang of it. All right, moving on. Determine the equation of the axis of symmetry. Well, guess what? We already figured out that that's just going to be a matter of writing x equals some number. And what is that number? Well, that number will be the um, x-coordinate of the vertex. It's going to be this number. It's going to be negative 1. Um, if you were paying very close attention to the last video, that was covered for sure. So the equation of the axis of symmetry will be x equals negative 1. All right. Once again, where did we get that negative 1 from? This number right here. It's the x-coordinate of the vertex. The x-coordinate of the vertex will always be this constant right here when you're determining the equation of the axis of symmetry. I want to reiterate, the teacher is looking for this entire thing as the final answer to this question. So you don't want to just write negative 1. You want to write x equals negative 1 as the final answer. All right? So that is very important also. OK, moving on. Let's see, determine the domain. So the domain, once again, for the reasons stated earlier, will be negative infinity, comma, infinity. So that's definitely true. OK, determine the range. Well, as I had sort of advised before, you might want to just graph this thing right now, because uh, we have a lot of information. We have enough information to make a decent graph. I'm actually going to erase this too. Why not? We have enough information to make a decent graph. So I say let's go ahead and do it. And that will help us find the range fairly easily. So um, the coordinates of the vertex, let's start there. That is negative 1, 3. So and negative 1, 3 would be right here. So we got that under our belt, which is fantastic. Um, let's see. Uh, determine the coordinate of the y-intercept. Um, so that's 0, 2. So that will definitely be right here, which makes sense because we know that we want this parabola to be pointing down because of the first question, right? So that already kind of shows that, you know, it, the vertex is right here. It's going to be going down from there. All right, moving on. Find, oh, yeah, yeah. Find the solutions of the function. All right, negative blah, 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 all this crap, right? And that relates to determine the coordinates of the x-intercepts. Well, uh, these are the moments where we really want to pay attention. Um, you know, we're going to plot those points. And uh, obviously, you know, we don't have to be, like, precise, you know. Negative 2.7, I'll call it that, and this would be 0.7. So, negative 2.7, eh, it's going to be like around here. 
right? And then 0.7 is going to be like right there. It's actually pretty good. You know, we got like five. We're, gonna, we're about to have five points. Um, and that's a decent amount of points to graph a decent parabola. Okay, let's see. Uh, determine the equation of the axis of symmetry. All right, you know, uh, we'll draw the axis of symmetry. We know that the equation uh, was, you know, x equals negative 1. So let's actually draw that. Once again, the axis of symmetry is a typically dotted vertical line that passes through the vertex. And here it is. And really the reason I'm drawing it is to just serve as that reminder that everything over here should be perfectly matched over here, which again gives us that sort of official license to draw this point right there. All right. Now, believe it or not, you know, we got five points. We got this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And that is most definitely enough to draw a nice parabola that goes down forever. So these are meant to be arrows right there. There we go. Nice parabola. Uh, we're kind of ahead of the game because graphing the parabola is the last thing they're asking us to do. But once again, I'm going to suggest graphing the parabola to determine the range because... Um, you can really easily see what the range is once the parabola is graphed, you know. Once again, the range is the set of all y values that are represented on this graph. Well, clearly this y value is not represented on the graph. Clearly this y value is not represented on the graph. I mean, these y values are like above the graph. The graph isn't even close to these y values, right? The first y value that's represented on the graph is this one, which is uh, 3 right there so um, you could sort of think of all of these y values going forever in that direction as represented on the graph so clearly the range is negative infinity two drum roll three bracket don't forget the bracket next to the number and negative infinity in this case is on the left, three is on the right. Let's just be really clear about this too, before we move on. Um, when you're doing this interval notation, you always want the lesser numbers, the, less, the least numbers, we could say, to be on the left, and the higher numbers to be on the right. Clearly, negative infinity is less than three negative infinity gets into crazy negative numbers. So clearly that is less than three. So this is the lesser numbers over here, and this is the greater number over here. In this case, it's three, okay? So uh, just to be very clear about that. So that pretty much concludes it because the last part has us graph the parabola, which we already did. Quick recap of everything. Does the graph open up or down? It opens down. How do we know? Because that's negative. Determine the coordinate of the vertex. That is a two-step problem where first you use negative b over 2a, which is going to give you the x-coordinate of the vertex. Then you're going to plug that x value into the original equation and find out what, it what other number it turns out. And that's going to be the y value. So two-step problem. The first step is to use this. The next step is to substitute whatever number you get from that back into the equation. And that gives you the y-coordinate. The x-coordinate is what you get when you use that. Um, determine the coordinates of the y-intercept. Well, first of all, the x-coordinate of any y-intercept will always be 0. The question is, what's the y-coordinate going to be? Well, that's easy. You just set x equal to 0. And then you find out what happens. Uh, in the case of these problems, it's always going to be this constant right here. So it's 2. Then it asks, find the solutions of the function. That's code for use the quadratic formula, right? I'm actually going to draw it right here. That's the nice reminder of the day. Mm -mm -mm. Use the quadratic formula. That's what this question, or this question rather, is asking. Find the solutions of the function. Use the quadratic formula. Whatever x equals will be the solution. If this radical, if you have a negative number under the radical, guess what? There's no real solutions. If you have a real number here, you know, if you have a positive under the radical or a zero under the radical, then you're going to have um, 
most of the time it's going to be two real solutions because it's going to be negative b plus minus whatever this number is. Actually, if it's zero, um, don't worry about it. <laughs> You're probably not going to get zero tomorrow. But uh, take into account the plus minus. Uh, since it's plus minus, it's often going to be the case that you will have actually two solutions. It's going to be negative b plus whatever this is all over two. And it's going to be negative b minus whatever this is all over two, which would give you the other one. So that is that. Let's see, determine the coordinates of the x-intercepts. Well, the y-coordinate of x-intercepts at any time ever will always be zero. So here's a y-coordinate of zero. Here's a y-coordinate of zero. It's always gonna be that. But the question is, what's the x-coordinates of the x-intercepts? Well, that would be the solutions. So you just take this, plug it into here. You take this, you plug it into here. Determine the equation of the axis of symmetry. Keep in mind, the equation of any vertical line will be x equals some constant. So the answer to this question will always be x equals whatever that constant is. The good news is we know what this constant is. It's super easy. All you have to do is refer to the x-coordinate of the vertex. It's negative 1. That's going to be the constant over here. So you just write x equals negative 1 as your final answer. Uh, determining the domain, uh, my student's really good at that. Uh, when it comes to parabolas, you know, well, quadratic functions that feature parabolas, it's always going to be negative infinity to positive infinity every time. Determine the range. I would advise graph the thing first, actually. You already have enough information to do that. You have to do it anyway, also. And use the visual approach to find the range. Find out, well, what's the highest y value? What's the lowest y value. The lowest y value in this case is negative infinity. The highest y value in this case is positive three, clearly, by looking at the parabola. And you just write that down in interval notation. And then finally, <coughs> excuse me, it says graph the parabola. Well, guess what? We already did it, so that part's done. Anyway, this concludes a video, it wasn't really a quick video, um, that covers the topics that me and my student went over. He's going to be doing a, a teamwork sort of collaborative uh, project that features this stuff on Tuesday. So I would love for him to be the MVP. Um, and hopefully with this video, uh, he will be able to. All right. So hope you enjoyed it and take care.